This morning, if you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 11. Last week, I preached on uh, uh, love and the conditions that are placed upon one that experiences love. If you remember that, and actually, that sermon last week had two parts to it, and actually this is the second part. And I didn't mention it last week that those two parts simply because sometimes things change and God gives me a, another message or uh, makes me go another direction. But uh, this is uh, part two of on one condition for those that were here last week. You know, like I said, I preached on one of the most fulfilling, wonderful, confusing, emotional, and perplexing experiences we will ever encounter, and that is. Love. Come on. How many know love will make a brother trip? Come on. It will be confusing at times. It will be very emotional at times, if not all the time. It's also fulfilling. It's one of, it could be and is one of the greatest experiences as humans we can uh, experience, right? And I talked about uh, human relationships uh, and when you and I make a decision to uh, commit and as we fall in love with someone and, and all the conditions that are placed on that one act of love and then obviously marriage and and you can and there's more than you cannot just live on love alone right remember that um, but the part two is, is it, I want to deal more with uh, when it comes to the spiritual things on our commitment and the decision we make to serve God and that there are conditions, right? We talked about that, right? Remember, I used a scripture last week in John 14. I said, you know what? Jesus said, if you love me, he said, what? Keep my commandments. Remember that? And in that chapter, he went on further to say, if you love me, keep my commandments. Then he said, and I will do all these things for you. Remember? There'll be benefits and there's conditions to keeping his commandments. You'll, the Bible says that uh, he will not leave you as orphans. We read about uh, that he will manifest himself in our daily lives in, in good ways and, um, and in many ways that bless our lives. He will lead us into all truth. He said, if you love me and keep my commandments, all these things you will be blessed by. Remember that? Now, don't misunderstand me. Jesus is not putting conditions so we have to work for our salvation, right? In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, condition. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, right? In fact, the Bible does say without faith it is impossible to please God. I mean... I've heard that, that scripture. But don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that all these conditions that's placed, all these uh, stipulations in the word of God that we have to work for our salvation, but it's by grace that we have been saved. But with that, we still got to, uh, it's through faith though, right? There's still a condition placed upon us. Amen? Amen? Now these conditions that are placed upon us in, in the scriptures are there to protect us, right? Amen. To to bless us and to teach us. Amen. Okay. It's not like Satan's conditions, right. which will destroy us, right? right amen. You can. I mean, know that you cannot bargain with the devil, but many do. Many do, unawares, unknowingly. Or deep down, they know. We know when we're bargaining with the devil. Let's be real this morning. Let me give you an instance. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 4, uh, Jesus was embarking on his new ministry? And the Bible says that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness uh, where he would be tempted by the devil. Remember that whole experience? And the Bible says that he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and and the Bible says that he was hungry. Obviously, 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine without food? All right. And 
the devil came. Because let me know when you and I decide to grow spiritually, when we sacrifice uh, things in our lives, that the enemy wants right away to discredit us, hinder us, or simply distract us, or destroy us from even going further. So here comes the enemy. Jesus is in the wilderness. He had been, like I said, tempted. Uh, I mean, he had been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil came, and he says, and one of the first things he says is, if you, if you are the Son of God, remember that? Command these stones to become bread. Remember that whole uh, conversation there? And Jesus responds with scripture, and he said, you know what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, right? So he combated, amen, Satan's attack with the word. Then if you remember, uh, Satan took him on top of the temple. He said, okay, if you were the son of God, throw yourself down. Remember that whole experience? And Jesus said, oh, and then he used that scripture about angels will, you know, protect you and all that, right? Remember that? But the big if was at the last temptation when he says, all right. If you are, uh, well, let me, let me go back, let me backtrack. He took, the devil took him up on top of a mountain. And he said, look at all these kingdoms. He said, if you bow down, all right, I will give you all these kingdoms. They will be yours, all right? All these things I will give you if, you will fall down and worship me. Okay. Now, how many know, amen, that the Satan, the devil, he comes to you and I, and he tempts you and I, and he always places conditions, though, right? How many of God's people have been tempted by Satan and did not realize that there were conditions attached to that new job? Come on. There, there was conditions attached to that new person you involved your life in. Come on. Amen. Satan came and tempted you. Right? He said, you know what? I'll give you this job, but you're going to have to probably give up some things in the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not trying to say that we should not work, because the Bible says if we don't work, we do not eat. And I don't know about you, but I'm a fan of eating. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but he said, you know, Many a people have been tempted by God with a new endeavor, a new career challenge, and it has taken them simply out of the kingdom of God. And those conditions that they did not even see, did not realize that Satan had placed a condition, I'll give you this, I'll give you more dollars an hour, I'll give you more a year, your salary will be higher, and this and that. But he didn't reveal the condition if you accept the offer, right? We think for the most part it was God, it was the Lord. Let me share something with you. These are no-brainers. When there are opportunities in our life and they will take you out of the kingdom of God and distract you, hinder you, or deter you, that is not from the Lord. It is a no-brainer. But somehow, some way, we convince ourselves that it is from God. And there we go, there was conditions placed. That relationship, a relationship. Hello. How many people have been disqualified from the kingdom of God because of a person? Amen. You should say amen, right? Mm -hmm. Come on. There was conditions on that relationship that we didn't recognize. Oh, but they started to flare up here and there. The red flag began to wave. You start hearing those comments. Well, church is not that important. Why are you all fanatical? <laughs> the pastor, all he wants is your money. <laughs> Have I gotten all your money? No. So it ain't me. Don't blame me. <laughs> huh? You don't have to be that committed. How about me? You're neglecting me. Right? And not only that, it, they might not even say anything about the kingdom of God or church, but the behaviors, and all of a sudden, there's things to do on Sunday. You know, it's very subtle. Come on now. Okay. Yeah. And the result was, when Satan came and tempted people, God's people, 
they became immobilized, carnal, compromised, and not useful in the kingdom of God anymore. Let's be real. Let's be honest this morning. I hope we can be honest this morning. Amen. So, in the Bible, I found this text here. And uh, if you're there in 1 Samuel chapter 11, this story right here displays this very point about conditions that the enemy will, will tempt you with, even though we don't see him at times, and how you can be simply disqualified from your great calling in the kingdom of God. Chapter 11, chapter 11 verse 1, 1 Samuel. Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we'll serve you. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition, pretty obvious, huh? I will make a covenant with you that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. Then the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. So the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and told the news and the hearing of the people and all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field and, said, and Saul said, what troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard his, this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. Verse 7. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on all the people, and they came out with one Consent. Let's stop there. Here in our story, we have a group of people from a city called Jabesh Gilead. And they were surrounded by Nahash the Ammonite. He was a king, and his goal was to obviously destroy him and take over the city. And Nahash uh, came to them, and he brought fear upon these people, and the elders, the leaders of the city of Jabesh Gilead responded in this way. They said, check this out. We will make a covenant with you. We'll make an agreement. We will serve you. Just, you know, just don't hurt us. Don't kill us, right? So it's like, you know what? Hey, we'll make an alliance here, okay? We'll, you know, we'll serve you. We'll, we'll wash your car, take care of your dogs. We'll feed you. We'll do all these things, all right? We'll be your slaves, all right? You just, just don't kill us. And Nahash, he goes, okay. I will make this covenant with you on this condition, on one condition. There's only one. He says that I will pull out your right eyes of every man. Okay. Now we will talk about what, how, what, what was all that about. That on this one condition, let me pull out your right eyes. This is classic. This is the first instance of someone trying to put conditions on, some, on someone. Now Nahash, his name means snake or serpent. Most people are scared of snakes, are you? Why are, you, why are they scary? They're hard to detect. They're, 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 they're fierce looking, right? They bite and some, most of them are poisonous. Come on. Snakes are deceiving. We know that, what happened in the garden, right? Of Eden. You ever, call, you ever said this? Man, you know what? Stay away from that person. They are a snake. When we say that about a person, oh, they're a snake. That means they're very cunning, deceiving, and they will hurt you. How many have been called a snake? We'll leave that one alone. Don't answer. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. See, I believe, amen, that there are people who think they can bargain with the devil and still get the better end of the deal. They might not admit it, but deep down, they know they made a deal with the devil. Come on. Hmm? Let me share something with you. The devil 
All right, we'll never give you the benefit or the advantage. Let me share that with you. I know by experience. I try to make that deal, that bargain with the devil years and years ago. And I shared this story before where I was at my lowest. I was on the streets in Visalia at that time. I was, you know, obviously on drugs, and homeless. And, and during those times in the late 80s, early 90s, Visalia, they didn't have all these new housing like there is now. And on the north side, as you're going on Old Dinuba Highway, they call it, they, they, you know, there was a lot of orchards there. There was no houses, there was no store. After the last game though, there was nothing. I don't know if you remember that. And a lot of times I'd go out to the great, the, there used to be great vineyards there, vineyards. And I'd go out there and do my dope in the middle of the vineyards and the walnut orchard, there was a lot of that. But at that point I was tired, I was sick of being, I was sick of the same old, same old. I, I was like, you know what? I was at a breaking point, uh, you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm tired of this, but then again, I, I got to make a decision. And I remember getting a lot of dope, a lot of it, as much as I could get, uh, heroin and cocaine, and I was, and I filled the whole syringe of it. And I was like, you know, if I'm going to do this, I, I want to, if I'm going to live like this, I will, I'm going to serve the devil from this point on. Really tough. More than I will, more, doing more things that I was doing up to that point. Because I really was like, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I might as well go away, but I want the devil's help because it's pretty mean in those streets. All right? And the hustle is hard. The, the loquera, the, the criminal activity, the, the, you know, at that point, I, I need at least between $100 and $300 a day for my habit. And I was like, you know, and it was getting hard, it was getting difficult, pretty people, and I couldn't go everywhere. I was like, and I'm in the middle of the orchard, and I said, you know what? Devil, as I fix this dope, I want you to manifest yourself and I want to deal that you'll take care of me or God, you kill me. That's how well, crazy, stupid, I don't know, but I tell you, when you're a dope, you can do some foolish thing. Come on. But I wanted to bargain with the devil. I did. I wanted to see the one that had ruined my life, per se. So I got that dope and that syringe, I put it in my arm and I, I shot the whole syringe. Nothing. Remember I shared that? Nothing. I did not feel nothing. Now, it wasn't bunk dope because this dope, this connection had always been good and it was the same dope. Any dope you'll tell you by looking at it, by smelling that it, it's good stuff. Now I'm trying to get you flashbacks here, okay? <laughs> so don't go there, just, okay? <laughs> and nothing happened. Hmm? That was God sparing me. I know that was God sparing my life. And I thank God I, I did not make that bargain with the devil. But how many know though that we can become used to the devil in certain areas? And we learn to coexist agreeably. You cannot trust the devil. Come on. He is not an ally. He was and is and always will be your enemy. His only desire for your life is to destroy it. He wants to kill you, he wants to steal from you, and he wants to completely destroy you. Be careful when the enemy comes and offers up these nice things in your life. Be careful about the bargain. Hello? Uh, a couple of days ago, last week, uh, my granddaughter asked me to build her a coffee bar. And uh, I think she was coming over to my house to bring something or... She was going to come over. She was, she was at Starbucks. And she uh, asked, called me and asked me, Grandpa, you, you want something from Starbucks? I go, no, nah, I'm good. Because you know what? They got this uh, Red Bull drink. <laughs> it's good. I go, well, I'm nice to drink Red Bulls. I don't drink energy drinks somewhere. I don't need them like the youngsters. But I used to drink them just because you used to drink them. You guys have bad influences. <laughs> and because it's just a Red Bull drink, you'll like it. I'm like, all right, go on. You know, hey, I tried it once, and I'm like, I'll do it again, praise the Lord. So she brought it, and she gave it to me, and I, I don't know, you know, they, they had like a little, they, they like a little coffee bean on top. <laughs> I go, what's this? Oh, you just eat that first, and then you drink it with your Red Bull, it's like enhance and does something. So I, I popped it in, and chewed it up, and drank the Red Bull. Man, I was turned. <laughs> I got turned up, and I was turned. 
<laughs> I was all shaky and jittery. Huh? I felt like I had I had relapsed. I was gonna call the brothers to come pray for me. Hello? I was looking for like, I need a dollar, man. I need something. I, I could not sleep that night. I sleep, I stayed up till three in the morning. That I don't know what was in that. All right, but I will never touch that again. I rebuke Satan. Hello? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I finished a coffee bar though in about one hour. <laughs> I think that I think they there was a hidden agenda there when she offered me that red bull. <laughs> My point being, be careful when someone in the world offers you something. You don't know what you get into. That's the moral of the story there. <laughs> so here we have Nahan. A snake. Cunning, deceiving. Come on. He wants to take advantage of these people who really are at their lowest. Come on. They, they are down. They're at their lowest. In fact, that, that word Jabesh Gilead means ashamed. It means low. It means dry. It means confused. It means withered. So you have these people that are actually in that condition. They're low. They're, they're tired. They're withered. They're, they're ashamed. They're dry. This speaks of a people, a person who has lost their joy. The anointing has seeped out of their lives. Why? Because they made a bargain with the devil. Come on, let's be real. And when you do that and compromise the things of God, you will become dry spiritually. You will wither up spiritually. For momentarily, you'll be confused. And that's when the justification comes in. And you begin to even believe your own lies and the lies of the enemy. And the anointing will seep out of your life. Come on. The devil comes in. When we're at our lowest, think about this. Think about your greatest temptations that you have experienced. Usually they have come when you are at your lowest, when you are at your most discouraged, when you are at your, how can I say, uh, at a point where you feel almost faithless and hopeless. This is when the snakes slithers in our lives and into our minds and hearts and he begins to bargain and make a covenant. Well, you know what? Let me help you with this. Let's just make a deal. Right? I'll give you peace, a little bit of peace that God, for whatever reason, is taking forever to come in. He's like, it ain't coming yet. I'll give you a little bit more hope because, ah, you know what? For the things of God, you got to wait on. You got to do them right. And I can bring instant gratification. Just like that. I can bring the money, the pleasure, the companionship, just like that. Come on. You, you know the bargains I'm talking about. Hello. So here, Nahash, the snake, he comes to a people who are confused and tired and shamed. And they're at their lowest, amen. And, and he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. What's a covenant? It's an alliance. It's also a contract. It's also a, a, a covenant. It's also a marriage. Come on. See, when you... Make a bargain with the devil, you're going to sleep with the enemy. Come on, let's be real. And let me share something with you. I preached not too long ago that when you and I make a decision and a commitment to Christ, he takes that decision and commitment serious, doesn't he? Right. Well, let me share something else with you. Satan also takes all right, the bargain that he makes with us serious too. And he will hold you to your end. Mm -hmm. So here are the, the leaders of Jabesh, Jabesh Gilead. They said, okay, you will, we'll be your slaves, your bondmen, but give us about seven days to seek help. Give us seven days, all right? And we're going to see if anybody's going to come to our aid. We're going to, if not, then the condition of Plucking our eyes out and all that. You know what? You can do it and we'll serve you, you know, with one eye. Right? So what happened, there must have been people in Jabesh Gilead who knew about the power and the delivery power of God Almighty. And at that point, it was with Saul, King Saul, who had the anointing of God upon him. So these people came to Saul. They, they told him what was going on. 
And Saul got angry, and this is when he came to rescue them. Nahash, he, why did he want to pluck out the right eye? As I was studying and researching this, the right eye was very significant, significant in a time of war. Okay? You remember that movie 300? Men? No, the, the, the girls don't care about it. But men. Remember that one soldier, fighter, he, his eye got damaged and they put a binder over it and say, you know, you can't fight no more? Go, you, you'll tell our story. Well, we got that whole movie memorized right there. <laughs> and he couldn't fight no more because his eye was damaged, right? Okay, and though, in, in that time, see, the right eye was very significant in battle. Why? Because usually, for the most part, the shield would be held with the left hand. Because most people are right eyes, uh, right handed. And, you know what I'm saying? When you're right handed, you're also right eye, okay? And, you know, if you're Southpaw, well, you're blessed together or not. I don't know. Okay. So the, they would hold their shield with their left hand, and they would use the right hand with the spear. And obviously, when they would aim, they would use their right eye because the shield would kind of hold up to be covering their left eye. Get it? So the right eye was significant. So when you, if you were to lose the right eye or the sight of the right eye, that means you couldn't battle no more. So they asked the snake, realized, you know what? I can destroy them completely from battle again. There will never be a threat if I take the right eye out. Okay, Smart guy, huh? There will never be a threat. I'll never have to worry about them. They will serve us. They will rise up and come against us and, and, and have a mutiny because they'll be powerless. See, when people, God's people, make a covenant and an alliance with the enemy, it is simply going to cause you to be powerless against the enemy. You can't find him because your right eye is gone. Come on. See, in the Bible, to give up the right eye means to choose that which God has not chosen. It means to choose not to see the way God sees. Huh? It means to live by that which satisfies satisfy self. When we get up the right eye, that means we choose to live to what satisfies our self, our flesh. Come on. And before Christ... Weren't we living like that? Yeah. Now, how did that end up? How'd that go for you and I? Not too good, huh? We got on drugs. We ruined many good relationships. We got involved in a lot of bad relationships. Come on. When we live by the flesh, for the most part, it never ends well. So we come to Christ. We repent of our sin. He empowers us. He fills us with the Holy Spirit. We begin to serve Him out of gratitude, uh, out of love. And we begin to experience His great and many blessings. And we keep His commandments, like I said earlier in John chapter 14. And now we experience all these blessings. But how many know the enemy is not done with us? Just because now you're, you know, you're, you're a Christian now, you're going to church. How many know that He is after you and it is in a relentless attack day after day after day after day? Sometimes I refer to the devil as someone from prison. Let me tell you something about people, convicts. They wear people down. They will call, call, write letter after letter. Come on. They got plenty of time to just bring you down. They wear you out. Come on. And how many know you get tired of saying no? How many are just tired of saying no? Uh, no on this, no on that. Let me tell you something. I've been serving God for 28 years. I have said no to Him 3 million point five times. <laughs> hmm? wow. Have I said no every single time? No. Hmm? But at the end of the day, I know the deception and I know the trap. Come on. See, the right eye is symbolic. In the Bible, the right hand is symbolic, right? We know that. If you read the Bible, 
The right hand is a is a, is the hand of blessing. Did you know that? It symbolizes that which God has chosen. And to give up the right eye means to choose that which God has not chosen. It means not to choose the way God sees, like I mentioned earlier. It means I agree not to call sin, sin. Come on. You ever meet people that all of a sudden now sin? Is, they, they, no, that's not sin. Yeah. We begin to think like the world. Homosexuality? Oh, that's just an alternative lifestyle. Come on. It's sin. Oh. Pro-choice. Pro -cho no, God calls it abortion. He calls it murder. And he calls it sin. Fornication. Sex before marriage. The world calls it experimenting or shopping around. God calls it fornication. And he calls it sin. Adultery. Ah, the world calls it. It's just a mistake. Bad judgment. No, God calls it adultery. It's a sin. Now, I'm not here to bring condemnation and guilt because when I came to church, all right, I, I, you know, I was doing the same thing, but I realized that I had to make changes in my life, and I did, right? Hmm? We all did, for the most part. Most of us came to church, living all kinds of people, at least one. And we started hearing the Word of God, we felt the conviction, and we made a decision for marriage. And, and this is why we're married now, right? Not so much that because of sin, but that, was, that had a lot to do with it, right? We don't want to live like that. You know, and also, you know, we love the person that we're with and we chose to commit our lives to them, right? Amen. Huh? But what happens when we make a deal with the devil, we're stripped of conscience, integrity, conviction, and courage. The Bible says that we see our conscience as a hot iron. That you know, if we compromise enough with one thing or many things, that our conscience begins to become hardened and seared. You, you remember back in the day, we used to, you know, before we go out, you know, we used to get the Levi's. We, man, we just put the hair, the, where the, the clothes spray. Boy, it's sharp. It's crazy. We're sharp. You cut yourself off. Remember? Old school, right? It's called Bonnaroo. Remember Bonnaroo? You know? Bonnaroo. Well, I got youngsters don't know nothing about that. Uh, now that you guys wear pants halfway down, so half your butt. Uh, right? <laughs> uh, clip your toenails and do your eyebrows and wear your earrings. <laughs> That's alright. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she loves you. No, I just mess with you guys. In our church, you don't no more skinny jeans if you're under 30. <laughs> oh, over 30, excuse me, over 30. <laughs> And we forbid man buns. Who started that anyway? <laughs> man, what the heck is that? Man buns. They see that? <laughs> what man? Our world. What the hell? <laughs> man buns. Some guy is more prettier than a girl. Uh, yeah. And I, ain't, I don't even roll that way. <laughs> <laughs> Hope we don't play that. <laughs> Ah, oh, Lord, let me get on before I get in the flesh. Mm -hmm. My point being, church, is that we must be careful when the enemy comes and, and begins to want to bargain with us. And he wants you to compromise in certain, area, in certain areas of your life. Whether it be financially, whether it be uh, relation, relationships, whether it be... Uh, there's so many areas that there's so many areas where the devil could come in. He comes in in a way that we don't even think that he can harm us. Come on. Like I said, I have seen snakes go into a little crack that big. They flatten themselves out. They're able to go all right, in an area that you, there's no way. Or a mouse. Come on. You ever have mice problem? You're like, where the heck are they coming in from? And there's a little old hole about that big. They get in, don't they? Come on. Mm -hmm. So the elders, let me bring this down to the end here. The elders of Jabesh said, give us seven days. Let us, first, let us serve for someone to help us, right? And like I said earlier, someone thought about Saul, the, the anointed king. And here was a man that was anointed by God, and they went to help. They went for help from him. And sure enough, the Bible says that King Saul 
He got the Holy the Spirit came upon him, and he had a holy, righteous anger towards Nahash and the people that would try to hurt these people. Come on. My point being, it seems that people don't get angry anymore when the devil is just running around deceiving everyone. People don't get angry no more. They accept compromise. They accept, you know, it is what it is. They, they accept, well, you know, well, that's the way it is now. And, you know, that's the, the sign of our times. It's culture. It's our culture now. And this and that. But look at our world now. Look where it's at. Huh? The devil came in years ago and made bargain with people from the church world and beyond. And look how much we have compromised. The world is compromised. Our world, amen, it is steeped in sin, ugly sin. I was listening to the radio that they did know in France, they're going to make a law that the age of accountability when it comes to sex is 15. So in France, if you're 15, you can have an affair, you can have a relationship with someone older than 15. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. You're going to have these old perverts going out there, these 15-year-olds, come on. And they're going to fall for it, amen, because they're young and there's money and there's this and there's that. There's love, whatever you want to call it. This is our world. California law, oh, don't even get me started. Uh, they're giving these compromises to these pedophiles, too. Come on, it's all bad. What, why? What happened to our nation? Compromise is the word of God. The preaching of sin began to wane in the churches. And I'm not standing up here as a church. Oh, we got the truth. And you know what? We, you know, no, come on. We've all failed from here that way. Yeah. Right? But one thing we do is that when there is sin, we deal with it. Right. I will preach on what God gives me, amen. Whether fornication, whether adultery, whether, you know what, uh, hip, being a hypocrite. I will deal with them, amen. Not because I'm trying to be just a holy fight and fire and brimstone preacher. But it's to convict us of sin so we can repent and make a trail for holiness in our lives. Amen. So the Bible says, amen, that when Israel heard about this people of Jabesh Gilead, they began to weep. They began to cry. But that's, that's a, that reminds me of the church that a lot of times all we do is weep and cry, oh, boy, see, told Look at the people. And, and we ourselves are not doing anything to help. Come on. Where is the standard? Where are the examples in the church? Now I'm speaking in general terms of all churches. Of men and women who are spirit filled. Who are, right, how can I say, uncompromising. Standing on the word of God. Striving for purity and holiness. Where are they? I hope they're here. Amen. They used to be. Amen. That's it. I'm going to come back this year. <laughs> <laughs> like my wife always tells me, the shoe fits, put it on, boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tie each lace. <laughs> Satan's kingdom will not suffer at all until the church rises up in holy fire and anger against Satan and his works. Are you even angry at what Satan is doing to your children? Come on. How he's destroying them, amen, with drugs, compromise, sex, games, violence, and all these ungodly. I mean, I can I mean I am perplexed still at what young people are doing. And they reveal it all day long on TikTok. Huh? Girl on girl, girl on five boys, five boys on ten girls. It's like normal. And the church is crying and praying. That's it? No, what the church is doing be the example. That's right. Yes. They gotta, people gotta look to those, right, that have changed, genuine change. I'm not trying to sound super spiritual and self righteous here, but I'm talking about true change. And I can preach like this because my people know what I'm about. My family, my grandkids, they know I'm not perfect, but they 
know that my wife and I have tried to be example to the best of our ability. And they will rebuke me if they, if they see something different. Hello? One time my granddaughter, she was younger, she walked in on watching ridiculousness. You're watching ridiculousness. Got, I got rebuked by Desiree. Even though she watched all day long, it probably worked. <laughs> it is funny though. Anyway, they didn't walk. Okay. They got rebuked. Because they, they know they expect holiness and righteousness from us. So when we deter a little bit from that, what are you doing listen to that song? Your grandma put it on, it wasn't me. <laughs> hey, 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 I'm throwing everybody under the bus. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, huh? Isn't that true, parents? Don't our kids rebuke us? Even though they're the devils themselves, but they will rebuke you because they know, they know your behavior. They know the minute you're not acting safe, they will rebuke you and pull you to the carpet. Come on. So what is, let me wind this down, huh? What has happened to God's people in general? We have broken the covenant of the right eye. And when you don't have the right eye anymore, you cannot fight. You cannot battle the enemy like you used to. You're, you, you're almost powerless. The devil comes in, like I said, he slaps you and I like a red-headed stepchild. We have chosen to live by the power of the flesh instead of the power of the Holy Spirit. But there, come on, this, isn't there a tremendous pressure today to make a covenant with the flesh and live according to the flesh by, while calling it a spiritual life? Isn't it, come on, isn't it tempting? Isn't there like pressure that, you know what? Well, you know, I know people that go to this church and that church and have this belief and they're blessed. Are they? The Bible says you will know them by their fruits. Because every tree, the Bible says, bear fruit. Amen. Good fruit or bad fruit. Right. So when a person comes to you and gives them their ideas and ideologies and beliefs and doctrine about how the church and Christ should be, but if you look behind them with the tree and the fruit that they're bearing, that's how you can tell. There are people that, you know what? Oh, they will sound so righteous and seem so right, but there's no fruit there. What are they doing in the kingdom of God? Where's the fruit? Are they burying and making disciples? Are they making an impact in the kingdom of God, in their cities, in their homes? They can bump their gums all day long and sell wolf tickets and speak out of their net. But I look to the fruit. So, as I close this morning or this afternoon, which class of people or what type of person are you here today? Hmm? Are you willing to give up your right eye? Hmm? All right. Or are you the one that's just weeping hopelessly for the condition of the loss but not doing nothing about it? Hmm? Because you don't got time, you got a thing going on. You're praying for them. Good that you're praying. Let me know action. Or are you filled with Holy Spirit anger against sin and Satan? Okay. Are you willing to bring the oppressed to deliverance by the power of God, by exampleship and testimony? Are you willing to get involved in the kingdom of God? To make an impact in the lives of people. This is why, as I close, this is why I've always challenged God's people to rise up in ministry. Not so we can say we have a ministry, so we can put a banner back there and say, oh, look at all the stuff we're doing. No, it's to be examples for those right kids, those people in convalescent homes, the streets, come on, and beyond. And the only way we're going to make an impact, you and I must be cleansed of unrighteousness and filth and sin before God can use us. And we must be vessels of honor. Right. Right. Well, in the other church, you, you can do all kinds of stuff and still have a position as the head song leader, as the head keyboard player. Come on. Let me tell you something. If my wife was in sin, I'd sit her down. If I was in sin... <laughs> 
I'm sorry. I mean, another church's pastor's wife would do that. <laughs> now I get my point. If I was it, I wouldn't be standing up here. I get pulled <laughs> by my leadership. Amen. I get sat down, right, and be restored. We just left the ministry that their head leader was booked and found out was sinning, and he was pulled to the carpet. And he simply got rid of all, all the leaders and he's still up there preaching like nothing. Hmm? No accountability. Praise God. What a beautiful day it is today, this Sunday. Hmm? Praise God. On one condition, be careful of that condition when it lands on your lap and you read that contract. Read the fine print. A lot of us have gotten a lot of financial heartache because we did not read the financial, the small print. I know what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Praise God on one condition, part two. Let's bar our heads. Yeah.